Well, welcome, Professor Tapper, to this panel. May I thank Nuta for inviting me to speak here. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Um, I belong to a period when there was no Junuta, so I'm particularly happy that I was invited today. <laughs> Looking round the hall, I must confess that I have a feeling that I'm here as a dinosaur. <laughs> and therefore, I'm going to speak like a dinosaur. I'm going to talk not about what the JNU is today, of which I am very proud, uh, many, many things. But I'm going to talk about some of the issues and problems that we faced when we started it off. So bear with me. It's very much an old person's view of something that is still ongoing. Now, in talking about the life of a university, we have to keep in mind the fact of knowing what is the purpose of education. And I would say that the purpose of education is to ask, to learn to ask relevant questions. Questioning is absolutely fundamental to anything that has to do with education. To question existing knowledge and check whether it is up to date, because only by doing that can we make advances in knowledge and have these appreciated by all those that know something about what is being discussed. The mission is getting darker and darker and less and less accessible to us as we go through time. But the questioning of existing knowledge, I would say, is fundamental to education. And this is something that I would insist on. So JNU started functioning in 1971. And I'd like to pay a small tribute to the first vice chancellor, G. Parthasarathy, who had his good points and his bad points, as all vice chancellors have. But the important thing about GP, as we called him, was that he understood education. He understood what the university as an institution is. He understood the functioning of the university in society. Not every vice chancellor understands that. But because he had such a strong academic interest, he also understood the academic problems. So he was a kind of person who would say to us as we sat together and discussed things like uh, uh, making up a course and syllabus and so on, he would say, I do not wish a repetition of any syllabi and course of what already prevails in Indian universities. I want something new, fresh. I want a new understanding of knowledge. And he was very insistent on that, and he emphasized interdisciplinary research, which is one of the things that we uh, did pick up and, and, and develop. So our courses were very different. We were, in fact, exploring ideas, and that exploration is important. History, for example, if I can spend two minutes on that, it had moved from being part of what was called Indology to becoming a social science. This was a huge step, and very few, few people understood what this meant, even historians. We had to work out in great detail what do we mean? Indology means a narrative about the Indian past, history as Indology. It was very simple. You started the year by saying, this is the period we're going to study, these are the books you have to read, and then the story went on and on and on and on about people and events and what happened till you came to March when you stopped teaching and you gave them time, the students time to prepare for the exam. Now, instead of that, what you got now was, say, not a continuous narrative from beginning to end, but topics and problems that were picked out, and students were being taught 
how to discuss them, how to write about them, how to research them, even more important. Um, when I say topics that were picked out, I don't mean random topics. There was a framework within we, which each specialization worked out its, its topics. And what was this procedure that we adopted? We were assessing, first of all, very important and particularly important today. Unfortunately, we live at a time in this country when evidence is simply not taken seriously. Nobody asks for evidence. You can get up and talk utter rubbish and say, I believe it. And no one is going to say, what is your evidence? So we started off with teaching students about evidence and how important it is. And more than that, how do you test the reliability of evidence? Because not every statement you make is evidence. You have to test the reliability and prove its reliability. The emphasis then was on professional methods of training scholars in a discipline. Terribly important. And that's precisely what we suffer from today. There is, particularly in a discipline like history, a frontal confrontation between the professionally trained historian who tests the reliability of evidence, the generalizations that are being made, the statements that follow, with a whole bunch of people who have no idea what the evidence is, or if they read it, they read it in translation, in some wretched author translation, which is not reliable and who then proceed to make statements about that particular subject uh, with really no evidence and no knowledge. And this is, this is, I think, one of the crises in both education and in our intellectual life today. You cannot have rampant, non-evidence, non-reliable statements being made and being treated as serious statements that have to be discussed. This is a crisis that we are facing in which we have to find a way out of. And obviously this conflict will remain and will continue until education improves to the point of people realizing the centrality and the crucial basis of the reliability of the evidence that you turn to. And in all this, therefore, we as academics were very protective of one foundational idea, our right to think freely. Because if you're going to question knowledge, and if you're going to say that, you know, we are going to question the reliability of evidence and prove whether it is, it is uh, reliable or not, and all the other questions that follow, you have to protect your right to think freely and not be. So we have to discover their history, and they discovered it in a particular way, which ended up one of their theories was the two nation theory. Now, this has been going since 1817, when James Mill wrote his book and brought it to the surface. And it's been going on being taught by British Indian education in India right up till uh, independence and after independence. And as we all know, the partition of the country was not unconnected with this theory. There is a link. What bothers me is why didn't we Indian historians from the early 20th century onwards start asking, is this really a correct theory? I go back to my insistence on asking questions of existing knowledge. Why did not somebody not get up and say, look, this theory makes no sense, not because we don't like it and we're emotionally against it, but in terms of evidence and evaluation, it cannot hold. Nobody said that. And the tragedy is that today, although a whole heap of historians have questioned it in the latter part of the 20th century and have thrown it out, today, 
The kind of history that is being popularized is precisely derived from James Mill and the colonial understanding of history. Why can't we get rid of that colonial understanding of history and say, now we're going to question what actually happened and look at the evidence? This is a much bigger question than, you know, GNU and history and all of that. It's a question of an attitude of mind, it's a question of a way of thinking, and it is a question of the basic imprint which colonial scholarship has made on India, which we are reviving in disguised forms and really not questioning in the way it should be questioned. It's not enough to say, oh, this is what the British taught, and therefore we get rid of it. Hamari bhi history thi, hum bhi akarenge jo hum ko sikhaya gaya tha, hamare poor rishwam liye poor vagaram da. No, that is not the answer. The answer is that on the basis of the modern technologies and knowledge systems that we are otherwise appropriating in terms of the way we live and the material culture that we've adopted, the Vava people going off to the planet and to the moon and this, that, and the other. The other side of that story is you use that knowledge of questioning to question theories about society and history and everything else, just to be certain that those theories are not garbage. And this is a very important issue, a very important question that we have to ask ourselves. Any questions here about the importance of critical thinking? I think this entire audience has agreed about the necessity of critical thinking, but this student asks to blame students in some sense and argue that stupidity has taken over intellect among Indians misses the actual point. Structures are constructed by the current desperation, dispensation, sorry, which incentivizes such linear modes of thinking. So do you not, or do you all not agree that it is these structures which need to be dismantled rather than critiquing students for losing critical thinking? I never blamed students. Please be careful in what you listen. <laughs> I actually said categorically, referring to my article published in The Wire, that stupidity is never a spontaneous process in any society. It is deliberately created by and as part of a certain kind of political project. So you students are not running that project. <laughs> so that project is being run by certain forces. They are creating that situation in which stupidity is becoming a virtue and criticality is becoming a vice. So I am not blaming you. But at the same time, Please listen carefully <laughs> and don't be in a hurry to respond. This is the social media that you have to do. attention train. You have to do it. You have to do it. You have to do it. Stand up together for the idea of a university. Is rewriting of history possible? And what could its repercussions be for us? I suppose it is the member secretary of the ICHR, <laughs> Professor Umesh Kadam. Yeah, and I'm sorry, this is the kind of question where I would like to spend one hour this evening just going on talking about it. I have, to, I have one minute, I guess. All right. Um, look, history is always being rewritten. There is no such thing as such and such a thing happened and this and that and that period and that that is the end of the story because there are always new sources that come up which make you look at the story again. For example, we are facing a very interesting situation today uh, with the whole discussion about what used to be called the Aryan question. It started off with you knew Sanskrit very well, you knew Vedic Sanskrit very well, and you were the authority 
on the Vedic sources. Okay, fine. That went on for a long period. Then in the early, in the 19th century, then in the early 20th century, suddenly they produced the Harappan civilization. What do we do with that vis-a-vis -vis the Vedic texts? Obviously, the Harappan civilization is much earlier. Therefore, all the theories about the origins of Indian civilization in the Vedic period and so on were questioned because you now had evidence that went back earlier, which is why there are some people desperately trying to prove that the Harappans also were Aryans. Okay, that was archaeology that came in. You had to be a good technical archaeologist if you were going to use archaeological ma uh, material, uh, archaeological evidence for the Vedic period. That went on quite happily. In the middle of the 20th century, the specialists in linguistics came in and started looking at Vedic Sanskrit as expressed in the Rig Veda and some of the texts a uh, slightly later period and argued that there were elements of Dravidian in Indo-Aryan. This is a very serious intervention which specialists in linguistics made. And what was the problem now? The problem was that if the linguistics evidence is correct, as most people think it is, then you have to say that in the writing of these texts, in the Indo-Aryan language, there are elements of Dravidian, which means there was an interface between the Indo-Aryan speakers and the Dravidian speakers. And there's other little bits of evidence that are being put together to suggest that there was some kind of interface. All right, that's one direction. Now, recently, what's happened is that the geneticists have come in and are saying that the analysis that has been done of the post Harappan burials in the Punjab and Haryana suggest some strains of Central Asian elements in the population that came and settled and lived there. And the date that they give to these elements is the same date that the Sanskritists gave to the coming, to the rise of Aryan culture. Now, all that I'm trying to tell you is, I'm, in, the, in this case, I have my own thoughts about what, how one proceeds. All I'm trying to tell you is that the difference between the history that was written in the late 19th century and what is written today on this question takes in technologies and takes in a professional training of very different kinds, which have to be considered. You can't say, no, this, I'm not interested in that, I'm only interested in the language, because then you're not looking at the complete evidence. So it's an ongoing process. As you discover more sources, and secondly, very important, as you give rise to new questions, and this is where history becoming a social science becomes crucial because history as a part of Indology had one set of questions which went along quite happily and everybody was pleased with them. And then you had the social sciences, you had sociology, you had uh, the economic history, the demographers and so on coming in, the anthropologists. And suddenly you began to ask other questions. What is the kind of culture that you're dealing with? And what is the kind of other culture that you're dealing with? How do the two sit together? How do they face each other? Do they have an interaction? Do they not so on? So a new kind of history evolves out of these new sources or new questions that are being asked. Um, therefore, I, I've lost the question. <laughs> what is the question? Yeah, so the rewriting of history is something that goes on. And if you read the histories that were written in the early 19th century, you'd laugh at them now because, you know, we've progressed so much since then in terms of source material questions, knowledge, information, asking questions, and so on. The problem is that this phrase, the rewriting of history, is now being associated with people who are not trained historians. 
And so you have, you know, gatherings where people get up and say, but of course we had aeroplanes in the Lama Island. It was the push on. Of course we knew plastic surgery because Ganesh is a result of plastic surgery. And of course we had uh, stem cell research because the hundred Kauravas were all born out of a jar and this was clearly stem cell research. Now, this is not history because it doesn't start off by saying, this is my question, this is my hypothesis, this is the evidence that I can assure you I have been able to prove is reliable and is accepted as reliable evidence by everybody else. And the generalizations or the statements that are coming out of this evidence are based on logic and rationality. They are not based on fantasy. Now, there is a difference between that kind of stuff that goes as history and the kind of material that we have and the reasons why we question that kind of writing because we think it's an offensive insult to the discipline of history. You're not doing history the way you should be doing. You're not doing it professionally. You're not doing it in a trained way. You're just passing off straight so thoughts. That's not history. So when you talk about the rewriting of history, please be clear that there are two things today that are popularly called history. One is professional history, trained historians, trained in methods, they're epigraphists, paleographers, they're Sanskritists. They, they have a very, very tough time doing history. I wouldn't advise any of, uh, <laughs> if I had grandchildren, I wouldn't advise them to do history because it's become a very tough discipline. There's that. And then the others will just get up and they've heard these names, they've been talked to by various people who've mentioned these names, so they pick up the names and they invent a story and they say this is history. Now you have to be very careful, as in all knowledge and in all subjects, to determine the difference between the professionally treated, competent treatment of the discipline and the pop treatment. Hmm? The next question is, why is it happening so often in history? Why is it that, you know, economics doesn't produce people who say, oh, you know, we have the equivalent of Malthus in the Mauryan period, and, and Cautilia was really somebody who was uh, almost as good as Karl Marx, and so on and so forth. Why don't we have that? Simply because in the process of nationalism, where you're building a new society, you need to build it on the foundations of an earlier society which you claim was brilliant and good and advanced. And so history becomes very important. You have to use history politically then to prove that your nationalist aspirations are all legitimized by past events. So this link between nationalism and history, beautifully expressed, as I keep on quoting him, by Eric Hobsbawm, who, who when he was asked, is there a relationship between nationalism and history? His reply was that history is to nationalism what the poppy is to the heroin ed addict. <laughs> That's the way it is. Thank you so much. It is very clear that we can go on and eat it.